Hi everyone, thank you for uh, tuning in and listening and viewing uh, to this podcast. Our aim of today's podcast is to go through some of the top questions that both myself and Carlos have been uh, been asked from UK GPs when considering a move overseas into Australia. Now, for starters, as usual, just want to obviously introduce our special guest, which is uh, Mr. Carlos Viga, a very good friend of mine. And for those of you who hadn't seen our last podcast, um, Carlos is a very profound individual who's been working within the Australian healthcare system now for, for, for almost 16 years, if I'm not mistaken, Carlos. Is that right? That is correct, yes. Carlos has had many different roles during this time. Um, so he's a very, very knowledgeable individual and has a clear understanding on the healthcare system over there. So it's great to have him on board of this podcast as well. No, thank you for the invite. For those of you, again, that didn't see our last podcast, myself and Carlos actually went through and provided a very detailed and in-depth understanding and overview on Medicare and the billing system for GPs in Australia. So if you haven't already tuned in and watched that one, I highly recommend it. Very insightful and will give you, as I say, a great understanding further into the billing system and obviously how the Medicare system works within Australia. Now, to move on to this podcast, as many of you will probably know, moving to Australia to live and to work as a GP is a very big move. It's a very significant decision. So it's important to make sure we're providing a comprehensive overview, giving our listeners and obviously our GPs uh, the information to make the informed choice that's going to be best for the, for their families, but also obviously for their careers. So today what we're going to do is we're going to run through some of the top questions that we've been asked and of course provide a great insight into this as well. So without any further ado, um, I shall move into one of the first questions that we that we get asked and tends to be the first question that most people ask is, um, is working as a GP in Australia as good as people say? So I guess ultimately, to go straight into it, the answer is yes. Now, many people are going to think that I'm going to say that, but from speaking to GPs over the, over the course of the past four years, five years, uh, I can confidently say that GPs find work in Australia to be highly rewarding. Now, that's not just for UK GPs, it's also for Australian GPs as well. Now, the healthcare system is renowned and is well known for being one of the top in the world. Now, it, quite often it is ranked, depending on the uh, on the website, somewhere between the top three and the top five. So incredibly rank incredible rankings and if you compare that to some other countries like the uk which is ranked 15th and uh, canada which is currently ranked 25th now in australia there's endless opportunities for gps so this is op opportunities where it can enhance your career this can be through professional development but it can also obviously be to gain a better work-life balance earn more money and also obviously have higher standards of living which kind of follows through to my next question that people ask which is around the work-life balance and is the work-life balance really achievable? Ultimately, the work-life balance in Australia is unmatched and cannot be compared to the UK at all. Main GPs are working an awful lot less hours. The full-time equivalent in Australia is 38 hours and you walk out the door. And at the same time, you get access to a lot more advanced software, providing a more manageable workload, allowing GPs to actually do their admin work inside the consultation and therefore work you know, fewer hours and have a strong emphasis on family time and enjoying obviously the yeah, the leisure and the sunshine that uh, that Australia has to offer. Because uh, Carlos, you know, just touching on that weather, you know, I know it's winter for yourselves currently and it's meant to be our summer, but for, what's the weather like with yourselves at the moment? <laughs> Interesting actually uh, question because um, I just realized today, which is kind of, we just passed the peak of winter and Today was tops of 21 degrees um, Celsius, um, <laughs> which, <laughs> to be honest, I'm not even sure why I'm still wearing a jumper uh, today. But um, yeah, it's, it's, I mean, I guess it's, it's still relatively cold for Australian, Australian um, standards. Um, yes. But, um, but yeah, look, I mean, this is the kind of uh, winter that probably we just experienced um, in, in here, um, especially on the coastal um, regions. So, um, I guess I can't, we can't complain really about the weather here. No, no, certainly not. Twenty-one degrees, and that's in there. That's in the winter months, and <laughs> yeah. uh, you know, over here it's it's currently our summer, and we're looking at sixteen degrees, Carlos. So wow. uh, it's it's just unmatched. It's just unmatched. It says uh, again, it's a big motive for a lot of people to uh, to think about moving to Australia. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, for the weather to get obviously uh, a bit of tan, which I do not blame them. Um, <laughs> But uh, yeah, you know, 16 degrees compared in a summer compared to where uh, 21 degrees in a winter, you know, it just says it all, doesn't it? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. 
Um, so, Carlos, I shall let you ask the uh, the next question, if, uh, if that's good with you. Okay, cool. Uh, look, I mean, the next question um, that we actually hear often is um, what lifestyle changes uh, can you know they expect when moving to Australia? And, um, of course, you know, without mentioning the obvious, which is, you know, like the beautiful beaches that, that we got in, in, in Australia, um, we can definitely expect a much more outdoor-oriented um, lifestyle. Um, and I guess based on that, you know, like people that actually tend to be much more involved with exports, um, you know, other types of like outdoor activities that, you know, um, that you can do in, in much war warmer climates. Um, yeah. So there's also, of course, the ability, I mean, it's such a large country. So there's the ability of, of course, to explore and, you know, just jump in, you know, jump in your car and travel all around the coastline if you feel or if you want to you know go and explore the inland as well and it's absolutely beautiful as well um and, and then visit the wineries like there's a lot of like wine ridges across the country um yeah i mean it's, there's so many places that you can just go come, come here and you know and explore um as a, you know as a, in a, on a holiday really Yes, I was going to say i'm sure it was, it was actually yourself that was uh, mentioned a little while ago um to me that you know, quite often a lot of Australians will just go on a holiday to, to other parts of Australia as well, won't they? Because uh, it's so big and, you know, it's, uh, you know, it's so different from one side of Australia to another. You know, there's so much to explore, as you say, that you can quite literally just jump on a plane, you know, go into, you know, New South Wales or, or you know, the ACT side of things and just have a, a completely different holiday, um, as you say, with, uh, with, with obviously what's on offer and, as you, as you know, you've already mentioned driving more inland. There's a lot of wineries and wine, you know, wine regions. Uh, you know, there's a lot of the different valleys. You know, a lot of different national parks, which, you know, it, it's beautiful. Um, and that's obviously moving away from the beaches that we've already mentioned, and that, you know, that gorgeous coastline that Australia have. I think they've got more beaches, more beaches than most other countries, or something along something crazy, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. So many activities. I mean. You know, you can pick any activity, you know, like camping is a big one, for example, here, as you mentioned, the national parks, like uh, there's so many national parks in, in Australia that you can literally just like, it, it could take you years exploring, you know, exploring each one of them. So, um, you know, you can just go, you know, just hook a caravan, you know, behind your car and just drive along and, you know, explore the, the beautiful country. So, yeah. Wow. Wow. I yeah uh, I need to come uh, come back on another holiday by the sounds of it. It's uh, try and try and tra do do some more traveling. I've got quite a few friends that have been traveling um, across Australia, and they just talk about how incredible it is, um, but also how, just how varied it is as well. So yeah, no, it's amazing. I mean, I I made the move for just almost twenty years ago, and I have not looked back because of of all these reasons. I mean, the work life balance, the sense of security in the country um you know for yourself and you you, you know if, especially if you've got family as well um that's also very you know um, very highly regarded and um the education is also like you know uh very like very good um in australia so there's a lot of there's a, there's a lot of actually things that um, even from my personal perspective actually take for me so um I, I bet it will actually of course you know will take for a lot of the listeners as well. Yes, no, definitely, mm -hmm. definitely. And uh, obviously, a, another question um, that we uh, we get, I'm sure you've had this as well, Carlos, and uh, I think you're going to cover it uh, cover it a little bit as well. But is is around the the earnings? Um, you know, are the earnings really as high as people mention? And I guess, generally speaking, the answer is yes. It's worth to know that when it comes down to the earnings, it is purely down to the individual and what they what they put in. So in Australia, GPs can earn a substantial amount and an awful lot higher than the UK. So typically speaking, we see somewhere around two to three times the, the UK earnings. But this, as I say, this is based on a percentage of billings. It's based on allowing you to get paid for everything that you do rather than having a fixed salary. So what this means is that when you see a patient, you're able to charge for seeing that patient. The more patients that you see, the more services that you offer, you know, the more hours that you that you work, ultimately the more money you're going to get paid. 
However, typically speaking, as I say, we do see full-time UK GPs move to Australia and earn somewhere around that two to three times the uh, you know, plus the uh, the UK salaries. Yeah, correct. That is actually yeah, that is actually correct. And um, the, the 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 earnings, uh, as you mentioned, of course, are based on um, you know what you um, claim from Medicare, which is kind of like the NHS system equivalent of, you know, um, in Australia. And, um, and, and and based on that, um, that's how you actually you're earning. So, of course, Medicare also incentivizes doctors that the better care you provide to patients, the better earnings as well you will actually receive. So, um, so yeah, that's definitely something actually that it's very... You know, it's it's a very good, very good for for doctors here in Australia for GPs. The way you get both that life, you know, work life balance, but also you get the quality in terms of the earnings and and, and the lifestyle. Most definitely. And for those of you that want more information on Medicare, again, our last podcast that myself and Carl did was all about Medicare and uh, the billing system. So uh, make sure you check you do check that out. Um, but Carl, so obviously by way of you know average salaries, um, again I know it's very diff- difficult to kind of mention um, and just kind of give a bit of an average. So I suppose maybe a bit of a, a high, you know, a bit of a typical percentage, and you know what people would potentially be, be looking to achieve. Roughly, roughly, what what would you what would you say that would be? So based on so how medical centers in Australia actually work on the relationship between the doctors and the practices is that the doctor is actually a contractor. So it's more like a business to business uh, relationship between the doctor and the, and the GP and the, and the practice. So therefore the practice actually will charge a service fee for, uh, for the, I mean, the facilities and for also for this non-clinical services that they provide to the general practitioners. So, so the doctor actually will receive or will actually receive generally receive around between 60 to 70 percent of what they actually build um you know to, to, to patients um so meaning that the medical centers actually would um generally will charge between like 30 to 40 percent service fee for those facilities and and, and and non-clinical services um so going back into the i guess the money value um you know a, a, typically a good gp uh you, you, you can try in GP actually, uh, you know, you can easily earn over, you know, 250,000, you know, pounds a year. Yes, no, most definitely. Most definitely. And as you say, it's all down to what you bill. Um, yeah. You know, we've, uh, we've seen a range of different billings over the course of the years. You know, with, you know, top, a top biller could be taking any way up to quite about a million dollars. Uh, yeah. Or billing a million dollars. You know, that's then minus a percentage obviously mm-hmm. but uh, you know we are looking at earnings that are going to be far far greater than uh, than, than obviously here in the uk for, for starters uh, you know typically speaking it's uh, it's not even comparison it's not even comparable it's uh, it's crazy yeah no absolutely i mean they it, it, uh, definitely worth mentioning of course the you know the mil- why such a big range is because it depending of course of what type of medicine you're practicing as well so you know, if you are also, you know, besides your daily general practice and consulting, you also do procedures um, or any other type of specialty that actually will, would uh, in, help you increase that uh, those earnings. Well, I guess that takes us on potentially a little bit more to our next question. Obviously, when people are earning so much money, you mm. know, I guess if you could share a little bit about the cost of living side of things, especially for somebody that's living there firsthand at this moment in time. Yeah, no, totally. Um, I mean... The, the the cost of living in Australia varies, so it, 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 if that question actually would be could be answered depending on where you live, really. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Um, you know, just because like in you know large cities like Sydney or you know Melbourne, you know that they they, they can just easily be compared to like London prices, and yes. um and, and and therefore they're quite high, but you know this is not the case for everywhere you know um you know all cities um i probably will I would assume it's just like similar to the uk where you know the depends on where you live in as well you know it can just be you know reduced the further you go outside the city um yes and of course you know with the high earnings that you receiving as a gp and living in a nice coastal area 
you know, um, outside, even just outside on the outskirts of, 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 you know, any metropolitan city, that could be a really good life. You, you can have a really good lifestyle. Um, yeah. So, yeah. No, definitely. And I think as, as you say there, you know, it does depend purely on where you decide to, to move to. Um, you know, as you mentioned, obviously cities like, like Sydney are very expensive. But then mm. if you were to compare the likes of, of Sydney to, to even Melbourne, you know, they are very different. Um, you oh, know, yeah. the cost of living is, 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 is very different to start with. But obviously it's a, it's a beautiful place. It's appealing to an yeah. awful lot of people. Um, and, uh, you know, I completely understand and can, see, and can see why, especially with having those higher earnings. Ultimately, mm. it's putting you in that in a GP in that top 1% of, of earners anyway. So when we're looking at being in these expensive places, you've got the money to actually do it in the first place. So it's not a problem. But as you said, if you look slightly further out, some of the suburbs, you know, traveling into the city, for example, having a bit of that mixture of, you know, city and, and kind of more relaxed lifestyle, you get a lot more for your money, a lot more for your money. So if you are there thinking about a house with a pool and a, and a garden and things, you know, probably look a little bit out of the city and um, to get a bit more for your money rather than looking at trying to be in a, uh, a skyscraper, for example. In, <laughs> in yeah, but on, but on like, you know, cities like, uh, you know that you know the, the second largest city, for example, in in Victoria, Geelong. Um, you know, is a lovely coastal area. It's it's they 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 they, they expect actually growth, um, demographic growth in 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 those areas like like Geelong, for example, or in New South Wales, like Newcastle, for example. They are like very you know like high growth um, cities because people who actually are living in larger cities like Sydney or Melbourne actually are choosing to get out of those but because of the cost of living. They're choosing to move to these much more affordable, still beautiful, still got, you know, everything at hand. So you're not gonna be in the middle of nowhere, really. It's still, you know, every close to close to everything. Um and and and, and you know with easy, you know, way to transport yourself around, um, you can still have a really good quality of life. Um so yes. Mm-hmm. Yes, which I guess almost takes on to our, the, the next question I was going to was going to cover, which was around where you can and can't work, because you know some of these other cities that we're mentioning, places like like Geelong, for example, or places that are just outside of you know other cities in in you know in the province in the territory, you are looking at them being you know more accessible for for international GPs and UK GPs. You know, the, an international GP in Australia is restricted by the district priority areas. So you may notice, the, obviously, the, uh, the district distribution priority areas, uh, so the DPA areas and the modified Monash model, which is the MMM numbers that you keep on seeing on some adverts. Um, now, as a UK GP, UK GP is very fortunate that their qualifications are highly comparable. So when they run through the comparability side of things, they're in a position where they can work within DPA location and anything that's MMM1 and above. So this does allow them to work a lot closer to the city than a lot of other countries. Um, Ultimately, it's resulting in a short kind of 30 to 50 minute commute from the city center with the city CBD, dependent on the city itself. You know, you've got places even like Canberra where you could actually be 15 minutes, you know, the capital city of, of Australia, you could be 15, 20 minutes from the city. Um, so it really does vary on the city. But then if you are looking at some of these, you know, second largest cities, the restrictions aren't there. There is more of a need. There's a lot more of a demand, obviously. So you will be a lot busier, provide, you know, ultimately resulting in, having, in earning more money. And, you know, the, the demand for GPs, I guess, is across the, uh, across the country, you know, both rural and, and urban. But when we are obviously looking into these different uh, these different areas and where you can and can't work, it's a crucial factor to kind of bear in mind. You know, don't just think I want to go to Australia. I want to live in Central Perth. I don't want to be anywhere else. I'm just I just want to be here um, because we do need to be flexible. These aren't restrictions that you know we're putting into place. These are restrictions that the government have, have put into place purely based on where there's a need and where there's not a need. Correct. And look, I mean, just want to add and going back, I guess, to the you know, there's the reason why, like, relatively, you know, like medium-sized cities like Geelong, Canberra, for example, and and cities in New South Wales, like just outside Sydney, um, are still considered DPAs because they is because the number of GPs is still not enough. 
for the demand of you know that there is actually for um, primary care and as i mentioned before it's because of this high growth demographically that is pushing this is maintaining at this stage is maintaining these areas as a dpa because as you know if you're getting one two gps and you know for every you know 1000 patients then you know, in in one year we got eighty thousand actually people actually you know moving into those areas. The need is still actually going to be you know in there. Yes, yes. Mm. I think the the need is is you know going to be pretty constant across Australia, isn't it? And yeah. With the, the the different health ministers kind of reaching out and you know you know shouting for for GPs, especially UK GPs. Um. So. It's there's a high need, there's a high demand. Um, obviously, yeah. from wherever you go in Australia, you will be sought after, you will be required. And uh, you know, from what a lot of clients t- you know tell me as well, you know, Australia Australians love the UK GPs. You know, we love their voices, but they also love you know what we can deliver. And you know, for some reason, our voices as well. I think. <laughs> Another question is how easy it is actually to find a job. In, you know, as a general practitioner in Australia, um, I probably that that will actually you know will elaborate from what we just actually just were, we're talking about. Where, you know, um, due to the, the the shortage of um, general practitioners um, here, um, finding a job can be relatively easy. Um, of course, this is depending on the location that we uh, you know we're talking about. Um, the more rural. The higher the need, um, then the higher the demand, which will of course will make it easier. Um, the closer to the cities, then therefore you will have much more competition. Um, there's still of course opportunities because there's still need, but it, it, it's just that the, the level of competition is a lot higher, and um, so that's just something that you know uh, people need to wear in mind. Um, you know, like I guess you know using an agency like Menlo Park, uh, you know. You guys actually, you know, clearly you you got a really good relationship with, you know, with with clients in in Australia with medical centers. So, you know, I know that that will definitely will you know go a long way with with you know with doctors and, um, you know, uh, that that engage with you. So, um, yeah, and and I think another really good thing is the, is the support that you provide, you know, and the guidance to go through this pathway, um, to you know to come into into the country. Which for it can be overwhelming for some doctors, especially if you are still practicing while you're in the process. Yes, yes, and I, I say I think you know from from that side of things, you know, the finding a job, as you say, it can be pretty easy at times. It's uh, you know from from a GP perspective because the need is so is so large. Ultimately, it's a case of finding a job where you want to be. You know, it's the full package that you know, like I said, like you mentioned, like we we offer here at Menlo Park. You know, having the the experience and the knowledge on these different areas, but also the different process, the registration and the relocation uh, support that we can provide. I think ultimately that's where it goes hand in hand and works really well for for a GP to be able to offer the full service, because as you say, you know, getting a job, getting a job interview, you know. And passing a job into you ultimately that's the easy part you know it's finding how we were going to set up our lives you know where are the kids going to go to school where are we going to where are we going to live you know where's a nice place to live in these areas okay well where what's the equivalent to our, we have a right move over here to find houses we you know what's the equivalent to that you know how can i compare these schools okay well i need to get my qualifications recognized and quite often you've got you know gps and, and candidates that i work with that they're, they're kind of mind blown by the situation that actually is enough to you know almost turn them away from from wanting to make this move so you know as you say we do offer the full assistance and the full guidance for for a gp you know we make sure that we're making it as seamless and as as stressless as as possible and ultimately try and make sure that we are helping from start to finish with the transition obviously i guess um you know that kind of takes on takes it it's on to a bit about the working conditions which again i guess obviously you you're there firsthand so i'll allow you to kind of answer this question and just give a, a first-hand insight if that's okay yes of course uh, so i mean so they're trying to i guess inquire about like you know what are the conditions working conditions for you know for gps here in australia um i would say they're very good um you know they 
I mean, there are a lot of modern, really, you know, beautiful modern facilities. There's uh, great support, um, you know, admin from the admin side of things, but also from the clinical side of things in terms of nursing support. Um, and, and, and there's a lot of focus on, on preventative care. And also from the elderly population, we go the chronic disease management as well. Um, look, I mean, another really good thing with, with Australia is that, especially since COVID, the focus in healthcare or primary care specifically uh, has been into pushing the boundaries with the technology and to make doctors' life a lot easier. Um, you know, there's there's so much work that you know workload that you know you have to do besides you know seeing and consulting with the patients and all the admin sort of things. It, in Australia, we're trying to make sure that that's actually much more streamlined and much more easy to manage. Yes. Mm. No, most, most, most definitely, and I guess obviously that kind of, whilst we're touching on some of the, the, the practices and and the way that the way that things are run, mm. I guess in theory that kind of takes us on to one of the next questions that we've we've got here around the the patient demographic. Um, so yeah, I can I'll allow you to to elaborate, you know, potentially a little bit more yeah. around the, the, you know, the patient demographic that an individual would see. Yeah, absolutely. So I mean. I mean, Australia is a large country, so the patient demographics, of course, we vary, you know, very, you know, extensively depending, of course, where, you know, where you're based or where you're practicing. Um, in, you know, in, in rural or remote areas, of course, the, you, you will actually find a much more elderly or indigenous, indigenous populations um, with a lot of chronic, um, you know, disease uh, around and illnesses. Um, whilst in, in like urban areas, of course, you will find much more diverse um, demographics. So we're talking about, you know, younger generations or, you know, people in working, working age um, and family structures in that sense. Yes. No, I uh, completely agree with you um, from, from, that, from that perspective. You know, it does vary completely on the, on the area, on, on the location. Uh, but it does just show, and you know, thank you for giving that insight. Because it does just show that people will be seeing a variety of of patients. It's not going to be a case of just seeing the same people. You know, it's not a case that you just have, you know, a, a patient base that's just made up of of kids, for example, uh, or elderly. It will vary, and obviously, the the number that will vary will be dependent on on the location itself. So, Carlos, um, I'll uh, let you move on to the the next question. Still partly through the uh, the registration side of things, um, I suppose, mm -hmm. but um, more maybe around the the visas itself for our listeners. Yeah, of course. I mean, there, there's 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 a few options um, that GPs would actually would have in terms of you know visas. Um, that I mean, I'm very well aware that you 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 will be able to guide them through. Um, and I probably just worth mentioning that you know visa will generally will cover the GP and and their family members as well. Of course, the, if they got children, then as long as they're under eighteen, then they they can be covered under the same visa. Um, those those type of visas actually would allow them to come to Australia to work, and um, you know, and to work on a full time basis. It will allow actually the um, the partner as well to be able to to you do what they need to do as well to work if they need. Um, these for these visa, these specific type of visas generally will come will require a sponsor a sponsorship from the um, clinic in in Australia. Um, and, uh, and, and uh, that also actually there is an, a skills assessment where you need to actually prove yourself, you know, your experience as a general practitioner. Um, but I mean, that would, that would have been an issue, you know, for, for our listeners. So, um, <laughs> no. so, um, but yeah, look, I mean, once that process is actually done, it, it's a very, it's a, I want to say it's too tedious, but it's just, it, once, you know, once it's done, it's pretty, pretty, pretty straightforward. Um, mm -hmm. and you know, people will then generally because they end up loving the country so much they end up actually applying <laughs> for permanent residency very soon you know very soon yes. after. um and um yeah i mean that, that, that's probably like probably just mentioned about you know visa situation you know just specifics of course will be depending on a case by case basis yes no most definitely and i think as you say there you know the majority of GPs, majority of, it's not just GPs, you know, ultimately the majority of people, you know, you, you were a prime example yourself, Carlos, you know, somebody, somebody that actually moved over to Australia and was like, oh, wow, this is awesome. 
I can earn more money. This is a better lifestyle. This, this is glorious sunshine, you know, a better work-life balance. And, and people then just think, you know what? I want to stay here. This is actually better for, for me. It's better for the family. Um, and as you say, you know, typically speaking, people then move on to applying for their permanent residency, you know, after experiencing, you know, how good it is. They're typically around, or tends to be around, you know, what, two or three years, years later. Um, so, so, you know, very, very quickly, you know, from that, from that perspective. And, you know, as you say, you know, when you, you've covered um, when you answer, you know, the, the visa does cover for your partner to work. It's, it's a question that I get so much is, okay, well, you know, I'm going to come over, the, the visa is going to be under my name, you know, can my, you know, what about my partner? And, you know, you've covered it in, in, in this answer, as you say, they can work, no questions about it. The kids are covered. Don't worry, you know, the visa will cover you all as a family. Um, so that's uh, that's awesome. So thank you very much for, for that overview there, no, Carlos. Absolutely. And yeah, look, I mean, there's other, I mean, there's a lot of other things that depending, of course, what the partner does for work and all those sort of things, then that can actually, you'll be able actually to have much more uh, flexibility um, in terms of the locations, but that's just, as I mentioned, for this is in case by case basis. Yes. Mm. Yes. And I, I guess when we mentioned about the, the skills assessment, in essence, that almost takes us on to our next question that we've, that we've got, isn't mm. it? Because, mm. you know, the skills assessment is, is done through the RACGP as, as Carl has mentioned, you know, it's not yeah. something that individuals would need to worry about, especially coming from the UK, because their qualifications are so highly comparable to start with. Um, but uh, you know, the next question um, is, is around exams. And again, you know, I'll allow Carl to kind of elaborate uh, on this uh, on this as well, please. Not a problem. So, I mean, when, um, when the doctor, GP, actually is going through the skills assessment through the um, Royal Australian College of GPs, um, there's actually two two outcomes from those from that assessment uh, where you can um, either become substantially comparable assessment which refers that literally just equal by equal with a gp in australia you don't, in that case you don't need to see the exams um if for whatever reason let's say i mean probably not enough experience gp experience you do have mrc gp but not even enough experience or, or any other specific type of case um, if you're not substantially comparable, if for whatever reason you become partially comparable, then in that circumstance, you will need to sit an exam um, at the end of the um, the supervision um, time frame, just before the fellowship. But as we mentioned, majority of you know of, of GPs with um, the membership of you know the the, college, the UK college, um, they're generally actually taken as a substantially comparable. Yes. Yes, and I guess the the people that tend to fall, as you mentioned, I've seen the on that partially comparable side of things. Is quite often people that are got the MRCGP, but they've got the international version, so they haven't actually done it through, do, done the full training through the UK, and they tend to be the people that tend to, that that fall into that kind of category. Uh, individuals from from the UK, due to the registration timeline, uh, the registration obviously timeline taking realistically around you know kind of nine to twelve months. People are gaining their, you know, their experience, and you know it's allowing people to then actually go. Okay, well, I'm in this part, you know, this um, substantially comparable side of things. I can go and move into Australia. I don't have any any exams like you know some of these other countries do, um, and as you say, you know, meet the uh, meet the requirements and easily work in, in Australia in, in in these locations that we've mentioned. So to move on, uh, the next one question that we've got is is the Australian education system, and you know, gosh, I, I know we mentioned about comparing it to the UK a little bit, and maybe we can dive into that. But just touching on the Australian education system as a whole, you know, you've got kids and things, you know, you've been there. How 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 do, you know what's it like? What's it like for our listeners? It's uh, look, I think the education is it's it's very good um, in general. Um, you know the, I will I will say for you the especially for like younger like you know I'm talking about like primary school um kids age, um the public education is is absolutely amazing um 
and I guess well, as you you know as, the, as as your kids actually get older, probably, and you know, and with a good earning, um, you can actually then uh, uh, afford um, you know a really good, high quality uh, private schools, um, in in amazingly the you know like some of the best schools are not even actually in the main cities uh and and that's this is definitely something worth mentioning so um you know yes there are really good schools i mean don't get me wrong in terms of you know there will be good schools in the city in sydney and melbourne and brisbane and you know um adelaide and all the other locations but like you will find really good you know high quality schools uh in locations like Canberra, for example, you know, um, um, right in the capital, um, and um, do you, I guess, I guess because Canberra being the capital and where all the um, embassies and diplomats actually reside, and where the the majority of the um, government staff work, the the quality of life of like cities like Canberra, for example, is very high. So. The standards are literally above anything else, and um, but I think we mentioned briefly on the last podcast about you know Cam- how Canberra is considered like you know one of the best you know like city li- you know cities to live in. Um, yes, in the world. It was ranked it was ranked number two, in fact, yeah. uh, second best city in the world for its quality quality of life, yeah. which is mind blowing. Um, absolutely, absolutely amazing. Yeah, so you get you know also like universities if you got kids in university age. Then you know, like universities like the Australian National University in Canberra is, is absolutely, you know, amazing as well. Um, I think we mentioned what well, we mentioned before about Geelong, which has brought me for you know the um, Geelong Grammar School. Like you know, it, it, this is a very you know amazing school, top top yes. five actually in the country. Um, is it? I was going to say yeah. I I had noticed. Um, now, I'm not saying this is a, a selling point for everybody, but uh, mm. King Charles actually did a stint at, uh, at, Jing, at Geelong Grammar uh, when yes, he was a little boy. Yes, correct. Yeah. Um, so I, yeah, I had I had already clocked that one, and it's a, it does appear to be and look like a very, very good school. Because mm. um, how does you? I know you touched on it pri- um, previously, just on you know comparing the private and, and the public side of things. Mm. You know. How, how do they really compare? Because here in the UK, it can obviously depend on the school quite drastically, where some of the public schools are actually giving out better education than some of the some of the private schools, despite paying yeah. for it. <laughs> yes. Is that is that still the same in same in Australia? Yes, and that's why probably when when I was mentioning about primary and and then you know high school and and and, and university, um, I find actually in Australia that the public education in Australia I mean primary school is absolutely amazing and uh, I mean I wouldn't actually uh, say for every single area in Australia but the majority of school schools actually are really good um, they have a really good um, uh, I would say like system um, you know and um, in, 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 in that sense and from the high school um, I will say probably the private schools have for a higher much higher, um, reputation. Uh, I wouldn't say it's bad, but it's just it's just the private school in in high school tend to have a much better reputation. But in, at the same time, then if it depends on what you're considering, you know, for your children, if you want them, you know, to go straight in into private school from primary school, then of course that will guarantee you know them a spot, um, you know, later on in high school. Um, universities are you know are also very good. Monash University. Um, if your kid, you know, if their kids actually applying to study medicine as well, then, you know, they're really good medicine um, schools. Um, the University of Sydney, um, University of uh, Monash University as well, um, it's, it's, it's actually one of the top as well. Amazing, amazing. Well, thank you for uh, giving us a yeah, good overview there on the education system. That's something that they, you know, they do they do worry about, especially for uh, for their kids and things. And uh, you know, uh, another one, um, another question that I get quite a lot uh, that people worry about is, um, you know, having strong networks, uh, strong professional networks of GPs. You know, and the thing to say is obviously that there are professional organisations such as the RACGP and the AMC, the Australia, the um, or the AMA, sorry, the 
the Australian Medical Association that provides strong networks and support. You know, additionally, there are you know other groups that people can join as well, whether that's within your area, within the practice, or, or online. Um, you know, there's a, there's a wide range of different professional networks for people. Absolutely, it's worth mentioning as well. The um, I mean, this is probably I don't know if there's any other country that got this situation, but in Australia we have two colleges of GPs. So we go the Royal Australian College of GPs, and we have the what we call ACRAM, which stands for the Australian College of Remote Rural and Remote Medicine. Um, so that's of course, as it, its name mentions, it's actually just much more focused over the rural medicine. Um, but they're both actually really high quality um, institutions. Um, they are very highly advocate for GPs in Australia. Um, they're very, you know, like very vocal. They do support actually GPs in terms of education um, and, 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 and development. Um, so, uh, yeah, I mean, they, they definitely there's this, this lots of, I mean, organization. And I will say the GP, being myself actually involved with the GP industry in Australia, I can say it's a very, very, um, I wouldn't say close, but it's a very, you know, united, um, united um, industry. Yes. Yes. Now, that's one of the things I have uh, experienced and seen myself as well. So I can uh, certainly agree with you from, uh, you know, from, from that front. Um, awesome. Awesome. So I guess obviously the, the last couple of questions I just wanted to kind of go through um, with, with yourself, Carlos, were, you know, you know develop, developing skills and, and kind of career progression. So I, I'll let you elaborate a little bit around developing skills, if that's okay. Absolutely. I mean, one of the things that um, in Australia, we in medical centers, and I will say primary care in general, um, they highly um, like look for GPs in general, look for actually to like um, develop in their, in their special interests, if they've got a special interest or any specialties that they're looking for. Um, like, you know, there's lots of, you know, big specialties here in Australia, like um, skin cancer, um, you know, ch not only checks, and, but also removal in terms of procedures. Uh, it's very big in Australia, as you know, probably because of the melanoma, um, you know, um, situation in Australia. But um, it, there's also, of course, all the, a lot of other avenues, musculoskeletal medicine, occupational health medicine, women's health, men's health, travel medicine, tropical medicine, um, I mean, you name it. So they, they, there's there's lots of actually avenues where you can actually focus yourself and do what you really want to do. I mean, outside yes. the just the general practice itself. Yes, no, definitely, definitely. And I think it's worthwhile adding as well that you know through the, the additional CPD and the additional skills people can pick up, it is ultimately going to increase their earnings as well. It's going to obviously result in them them you know being able to offer more services to patients, which is going to make them more money, and obviously build you know a higher patient base. And these uh, these skills are often actually um, at a different um, banding, aren't they, uh, through Medicare? So therefore, yeah. obviously, again, it kind of goes into uh, their earning pot and their earning potentials. Absolutely, absolutely. Like that's our specialties, as I mentioned, like. Not just in, I mean, just for example, like women's health, not just standard marinas and you know, just a normal, just normal day to day procedures. But if you know, the more focus you do, like let's say, you know, mental health, I just literally forgot to mention as well, you know, they can be just so big, especially after COVID. Um, so, um, whichever you know, uh, interest actually, special interest you have, I think is definitely worth considering actually, you know, developing yourself into it. There's, of course, loads of, um, avenues to develop yourself here in Australia. Um, so yeah, don't feel afraid, afraid from, from that kind of thing, uh, I'll say. Yes, mm. yes no, brilliant. brilliant. I think the last little thing to, to kind of add to that, um, you know, just before we close off, is gonna be you know, ultimately around about the career progression side of things, um, which I guess ultimately kind of goes into additional things like Cass was mentioning that, we, that you can offer by way of, you know, a numerous different specialities. Mm. But on top of these specialities, there are different leadership roles that you can look into, uh, progressing into, and different academic positions. Yeah. So it's it's not a case that you would have a hugely stagnant career or have to worry about you're just going to be doing the same thing for yeah, the no. next X amount of years that you end up going into Australia. 
you know, there's a variety of different specialities and different roles and positions that you can you can go into as well. So I guess obviously to, to conclude, you know, by you know, hopefully addressing these uh, these questions and providing some answers, and um, hopefully that's providing some of our listeners, you know, a more comprehensive understanding on, on what to expect, and ultimately make a, a more informed decision um, about moving from the UK into Australia as a GP. And as we've already mentioned, we understand this is a big, a big decision. It's a big career move uh, and lifestyle move for not just yourself, but your family. And you know that's why we want to make sure that we are providing such an in-depth support system for the GPs that we speak to, you know, sharing you know, a wealth of knowledge, but um, also obviously first-hand you know, experience as well. And as I have already tried to mention, um, obviously just touching on, on Menlo Park a little bit, um, you know, we do have a great team here who can not just, dis- obviously, uh, can not just discuss opportunities with you, but will also provide you know a good overview on the role on the Australian healthcare system, along with you know that first-hand experience from individuals that have actually lived in Australia themselves as well. So, should you have any questions that you would love to like to discuss um, or go through with ourselves, you know, please do just feel free to obviously reach out. And um, we're here for obviously to uh, provide obviously information for you, but also for your family and give that uh, support uh, system that you need to obviously make a, you know, a comprehensive decision on a bit more of a personal case by case basis. And our details will be, um, will be provided uh, on screen at the end. So to kind of wrap up, um, I simply want to, as always say a huge, huge thank you to, uh, to my friend Carlos, um, not just for his time on another episode with ourselves, but also for providing and sharing his wealth of knowledge and uh, understanding the uh, the industry and industry experience. So thank you very, very much, Carlos. Um, no, you are no, huge, you hugely appreciated, as, uh, as, I call, as I call you and will say to a lot of people, you know, Carlos is an absolute legend. So uh, thank you very much. And, you know, I do encourage uh, everybody to ensure you keep your eyes peeled for, you know, our future podcast that will be, uh, will be getting released. And, uh, you know, it goes without saying, you know, thank you very much to uh, to our listeners for uh, for watching and, uh, and listening to, uh, to the series. Mm-hmm.